Hey, this is a new format I, or better, we are trying. It is basically a little chat with Bismarck, who does combat flight simulation content. But he has also a degree in history and is very well read in combat aviation history. Thus, we decided to have a little initial chat about ground attack in World War II. So, let's get the party started. Something I'm very interested in is I, I read a few years ago a lot of stuff about Hans Ulrich Rudel the famous German Stuka pilot that flew around 2,500 missions and supposedly killed more than 500 tanks. And a few years ago, I read some articles that claimed, well, that's actually total bullshit and the effectiveness of ground attackers in World War II was extremely low in terms of destroyed tanks. So what is your view on this topic? Well, it's, it's interesting that you start with Rudel. He's always taken as this kind of shining example of you know, what a, a single person can supposedly do. Um, and you know, as, as, a, as a pilot who, like you said, apparently destroyed somewhere around 500 uh, tanks. Uh, the rather peculiar aspect of that is that when his unit was previously um, sent off to the Mediterranean in Africa, he was not allowed to go with them because, as far as I know, the official reason was that he pretty much was considered to be a very bad pilot. Um, so it's, it's, it's interesting how, how somebody like that, who is basically disregarded by his own unit, then goes around and suddenly kills 500 tanks. Um, it's possible, of course, but uh, as a single person with the uh, Ju-87 G1 that he was flying, uh, it is probably somewhat sketchy whether those 500 kills were actually done. However, there is no real actual way of proving it. Uh, you can go back into the uh, archives, you can look at the kill numbers, at the kill uh, confirmations and so on. But there is an extremely difficult aspect when it comes to actually confirming a kill. And what is a kill? That is the big question here. What is a kill? Mm -hmm. When an aircraft fires at a, a ground target, at a tank, for example, do we count a hit as a kill? Uh, do we count the confirmation of other pilots or ground units that they saw this happen as a kill? Um, do we consider... For example, let's say uh, Ju-87s attack a column of Soviet tanks. They have to withdraw. Um, they, the wrecks are still on the battlefield. And somehow German troops get there. They inspect the damage and they see, oh, yeah, these, these things are knocked out. At that point, you can say, all right, you know, that's a kill. But if you don't really see the tank in front of you, the destruction that was apparently caused for it to be knocked out, you can never be 100% sure whether that tank was knocked out without looking at the country's archives that that tank belonged to and looking at their kind of statistics on on this and this day, this and this hour, hour we lost these many t these many tanks to um, to air attacks. And when you look at the uh, testimonies of pilots of all nations, that's you know the Allies, uh, the Axis powers, and so on, you'll find. A lot of pilots say, you know, I hit this tank, I destroyed this tank, and so on and so forth. And then you go back into the archives and you check the, they check the, um, the kill counts, the official kill counts that were recognized by the countries that supposedly uh, had these losses. And you notice, actually, there's a big discrepancy here. And at that point, it's probably also a human psychological thing. When you attack a target and you have your crosshair dead center on it, you start firing, you see sparks, you see smoke, you see dust being blown up, you'll probably tell yourself that's a kill. Yeah. And then you fly over that tank, you look back as you swing around and you see, for example, the crew bailing out and they're running for their dear lives, at least that's what you think. They fling themselves into, into some kind of ditches and so on. And you say, well, yeah, that tank is knocked out, surely. And then you fly back to base, you check the gun camera footage, and it confirms the same kind of thing. You hit the tank, at least it looks like you hit the tank. You see the crew running away, you see you know, the whole dust and, and, and impact. And you also have some of these videos on YouTube where you see these attacks made by Stukas and so on on tanks. And you think, yeah, yeah, those, that, that tank is knocked out. But if you actually go back then, 
And let's say these these ground attackers flew away and the crew goes back to their tank and they look at it and it's like, oh yeah, they hit us, but uh, this thing can still drive. Or we can repair this within an hour or two hours or maybe a day. Is that a kill? Is it not a kill? You know, there, there's, there's a discrepancy here sometimes that you need to take into account when you look at these official kill counts that were given by all the nations. And also in, in terms back to ground attack again, the thing is, if you, if you fly like with 300 miles or 500 kilometers power and you, you strafe a tracked vehicle, who can tell if that was a tiger, a panther or just a half track? I mean, most, most allied forces, I think, considered nearly every tank a tiger. So, and this was even the, the case for ground forces. Well, the, the target identification strongly depends on, on the knowledge of the pilot and on his experience. Mm -hmm. um, you, I think, and you also, if you look at the, the kind of stories that you have from, from, uh, from pilots and their uh, combat reports, which are really the, the first thing they give after they land of what happened, you usually have a fairly good idea what they attacked. They're gonna say, you know, they attacked uh, armored vehicles. They're gonna say they attacked trucks or maybe even horse-drawn uh, equipment. Uh, a lot of the IL-2s, for example, uh, their combat reports uh, speak of German transports uh, or convoys where there was a big mix of uh, the Opel Blitz trucks, essentially, and um, horse-drawn equipment. Those things are fairly easy for a pilot to realize what he's shooting at. It's also necessary for him to realize because um, he can then decide what kind of weapons to use against what kind of target. Uh, if you look at, you know, like I said, horse-drawn equipment or trucks or armored vehicles, um, the IL-2s, for example, they would just strafe, the, strafe those things with their 23 mils um, and make significant damage with those. I mean, uh, one of those uh, Sonderkraftwerkzeug, uh, Kraftfahrzeug, uh, the SDKFZ uh, armored transports, you you submit that thing to a barrage of 23 mils and it's not going to be operational for a long time. However, once you then look at tanks, of course, there are different variants. And uh, oftentimes you have in the combat reports just saying, we attacked tanks. And at that point, they also uh, usually use the more heavy equipment that they have, the more destructive equipment like rockets and bombs. Um, although both weapons are extremely hard to use in a very precise manner. That's why you tend to shoot off rockets, all your rockets at one single target, or you use it as your first method of engaging a convoy when it's still stretched out along a uh, road, for example. That increases your uh, potential of actually hitting. Yeah, going back a little bit to Rudel, I mean, what I r read about him was that he they called it the Stucker Groschen, mm -hmm. which is the Stucker Penny, dropped rather late on him. On him. Yeah. This was they said he wasn't good in, in in flight school, and it took him a while, and then suddenly it blew up. So, what we can probably say, if those numbers are mostly correct in a way we can say he hit 500 tanks probably. He didn't destroy 500 tanks, but he probably hit 500 tanks. Those numbers, the kill numbers are probably exaggerated, but he also was a pretty insane person. And after all, if I think the, the number of combat missions is probably correct. And 2,500 combat missions, if you survive that, you have to have some skill. Oh, well, so, especially in the Stuka. Yeah, especially in the Stuka, yeah. The, the, like that goes back to what we said about the experience of the pilot, which takes a lot of uh, a big factor in all this. Uh, if you look, for example, at the IL-2s, they also had 37mm gun pods, uh, although the Russians omitted them in favor of the PTAP bombs. Those are like small, uh, uh, hollow charges that... They had around 200 of those on the IL-2s. They would just fly over a convoy, drop them, and they were pretty effective. So effective instead, in fact, that uh, after the Battle of Kursk, uh, the Russians said, okay, we're going to ignore those, those cannon gun pods uh, that aren't working properly for us. Uh, they don't fire sometimes at the same time. They make the IL-2 handling even worse than it already is. Uh, and we're going to use those PETA bombs. Um, but... The Germans took a similar approach with the gun pods that they had on the Ju-87 at first. 
uh, when they had these uh, pretty potent armament. I mean, we're talking about a, uh, a cannon that is said to be able to penetrate with the uh, Funxton round uh, 140 millimeters, give or take, at 100 meters, although that is at 90 degrees impact. So if yeah. you go, for example, at a, a 60 or 50 to 60 degree impact, um, the, the penetration potential halves, more or less. But we're still talking about you know 60 millimeters to 70 millimeters. Yeah, Almost that's depends. more than every t uh, top arm of a tank, as far as I know. Yeah, yeah. That, that, I mean that that is good enough. Um, and and what what could be said about the Russian cannon, for example, is that uh, they only used normal uh, steel shot. They didn't use a specialized ammunition. Had they used a specialized ammunition, maybe they would have liked it a little bit more. Um, but it also, like I said, depends on how the pilot operates his weaponry and his aircraft. So Rudel, for example, one of the things that uh, always struck me is how there was a big emphasis every time you hear something about him that people say he fired after closing to roughly 100 meters. Now, it's generally something that pilots are supposed to do, even the fighter pilots, you're supposed to get as close as possible to, your, uh, to the enemy aircraft, especially if you have a potent center-mounted weaponry and just blast them apart from as close as possible, uh, simply because that gives the most destructive power. It's the same thing when you attack a ground target. And uh, some of the uh, combat reports of the Henshaw 129 aircraft, it's the same thing. They keep on saying we are trying to get as close as possible to those tanks and then fire a few dedicated and very precise rounds into that thing. And hopefully, hopefully it blows up, but it hits are usually at that point when the pilot knows what he's doing with these cannons is probably something that is more or less guaranteed. Whether those are going to destroy the tank to the point where it is no longer operational, neither repaired or uh, you know, in a couple of minutes after, after the air attack is over because there was no damage, really significant damage done, um, that is another matter entirely. Yeah, of course, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Quite interesting point. So yeah, basically we, we're talking about kills or damages, uh, no, about hits and damaged vehicles and not about kills when it is for ground attackers against tanks mostly. Yeah. So, so that's, that's the point. So because I, I, I recognize on the internet there's there's the faction of the the people that say, oh, the Wehrmacht was so great, and then there's another faction that says, oh, the Wehrmacht only made lies. So I, I try to balance this because I know, okay, there's a lot of bullshit out there, but the bullshit usually comes from both sides. And oh, it always does, yeah. Yeah, and so this, this makes quite more sense that, yeah, he probably hit a lot of tanks. And I mean, as far as I know, the Russians also made various statements about him and I, I doubt they would have made statements about him if it was just a propaganda figure. Uh, one last thing I would like to mention though is the psychological effect of the guys who are getting hit. Yeah. Because that is something you never or hardly ever see in any kind of discussion that is based on the effectiveness of ground attackers. Everybody is so concentrated are you know on how many kills they've got oh you know at this and this and this day they, these guys destroyed 70 uh, t-44s or on this and this day uh you know the 10 panthers were destroyed within t um, a minute those are small isolated cases but the overall effect of ground attackers on the psych uh, psychological effect of ground attackers on the soldiers on the receiving end that is something that is hardly ever discussed but it's really really important if you look at the early war example, the Battle of France and also to some degree in Africa before the Germans were beaten back, uh, the Allies were, at least the soldiers, were extremely annoyed by the fact that wherever they looked up in the sky, well, this is an exaggeration, of course, but whenever yeah. they, they looked up, they would see a German aircraft. You know, if it's a BF-110 or if it's a Stuka just loitering around, something that is waiting for something to pop up. But the psychological effect of those attacks being on the receiving end, day in, day out, of an enemy air force that has air superiority, that is really, that gnaws something. And then there's, you know, virtual attrition coming in 
and at the same time there's real attrition because every air attack has the chance of destroying some of your equipment faster than you can probably repair it. What exactly you mean with a virtual attrition? Virtual attrition is basically, um, well, it's, it's a concept. It's um, inducing a state of mind in the enemy um, that he is unable to do certain things uh, because of a perceived superiority that you have. That's as best as I can ex essentially explain it. For example, um, let's say you are uh, being beaten back and you're trying to organize a counterattack, but the enemy seems to be always one step ahead because he has, let's say, uh, air recons up the whole time. And every time you try to make a move, he hits you with an air attack. At that point in, in time, you, of course, need to find a way to reduce the chances of these air attacks. And that means, for example, uh, relocating your operational uh, activities into the night. So you can't fully use your the capacity that you could have um, because of this this kind of mindset that you're in. You know, you're always being harassed. You're always being attacked um, during the or in the areas or during the times that you'd like to do certain things. Okay, yeah, that's actually a very interesting point because now you give me a name for something I read a while ago. During the Poland campaign, the German had air supremacy and this allowed them to use some of their transport equipment for logistics to actually transport combat troops to the front line because they didn't have to waste time on camouflaging their logistics. So they had more time and could use um, certain trucks to transport, I think it was an infantry regiment, into, into Warsaw. They couldn't do this later on because it was completely impossible. Yeah, that is also a, a, a point in time where you can say the aircraft itself is not actually doing anything, offensively speaking, but its mere presence is inducing a state of mind in the enemy um, that is essentially a paralysis. Yeah. And uh, although I must say, I find it when you look at the really official stuff that, that goes in in the army where they recognize their own kills, not the stuff that is sent to the public, but their own combat reports saying on this and this day we lost three tanks to air attacks and so on, you can usually believe that. I mean, what, one final part about the psychological effect. I always say boys and their toys. Military history is mainly something men do. And it's always about numbers. We love numbers, we love statistics, and well, we are not so good with feelings. This kind of is, I think, reflected in that, that we usually don't talk about the psychological effects of these uh, attacks. But actually, I read today that I think in the, in the divisional reports, those uh, air attacks were usually always noted. Yeah. due to their major effect on this. And I think it's just something that the soldiers were very aware of this, but usually it doesn't get it doesn't get reported because some people think maybe it's not interesting. For a lot of uh, the soldiers, it's also you know business as usual getting air attacked. Uh, so for them, the, the the thing is as scary as it is and as scared as you are in that moment when it happens. Um, if it happens five or six times to you, to you, you you know what to do. You know, yeah, it, it gets, you, you, it gets you, normal, yeah. Yeah, you run into a ditch, uh, you jump into a, you know, a cover, and you just wait two minutes and you pray to God or you know, whatever you <laughs> like to pray to, um, that, that so nothing hits you. Um, but why I think, and, and that is where I agree with you, that we're so obsessed about hard numbers is because it's very easy to judge or to at least think that you are able to judge the effectiveness of something if you just look at numbers. And there's nothing wrong with that as long as you keep it within the complete context of things. Um, but yeah, if, if you look at, for example, at this is, of course, completely different to, to the real study of things. But if you look at uh, computer games, for example, we are obsessed with numbers. It's all about kill counts. There is yeah. never a, a moment where you can win a match uh, by simply denying the enemy to uh, use his units operationally because that doesn't happen. Um, 
So it's it's always about the kill counts. It's always um, you know this is my KDR and so on, and that is especially true in combat flight simulators and and games free to play games that that show a certain aspect of a World War Two in a very very diluted and whitewashed manner. Yeah, especially free to play games because they are really dependent on player feedback. So you get always information when you hit something or something else because yeah. well basically that drives to a certain degree the addiction. Yeah, that is true. And it's um, also way easier to get hits. I, I'll just add that quickly. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's also way <laughs> I think easier we to add get that. hits uh, in a computer game, even if you're flying in a simulator, in a, in, I don't want to call it a real simulator, but yes, quote unquote real simulator, like let's say DCS or Battle of Stalingrad or Cliffs of Dover. Um, it's way easier to get hits in those uh, in those games than in reality. It's it's not the same thing. Simulations try to get you as close as possible within the technologically restrictions that they have to the real thing. Um, but you're never going to experience anything in any kind of combat flight simulator that is even remotely close to the a psychological aspect of what war is and especially at, in the later war to to bring this to a close of what kind of what some some uh, nations did actually nearly every nation did that was under sustained air attack um, so that's for example the germans and the russians is that they beefed up their aa capability within the frontline troops which is something that you did not really see in the early war stages uh, especially the germans and the russians uh this uh, later on decided, you know, to to put as many AA capable vehicles within their frontline troops, within the divisions, and so on, um, as possible, in order to, if not destroy the enemy aircraft, at least deter them away. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I saw this actually when I did a comparison between a motorized division from 1940 German and the so-called Panzergrenadier division from 1944. I think the the number of of AA guns uh, increased tremendously yeah. and there were probably additional units also allocated to the to the front line that were under the command of the army and not of the division itself so this number is probably also not representative these aircrafts were there these aircrafts would attack convoys and ground units which also brings us i think to a point which i want to address um, the difference between close air support and interdiction? It really depends on, on how you look at it and um, how you want to... Let's say just... I believe at least that every nation kind of had their own concept surrounding this. So interdiction at this point, you what do you mean exactly by it? Close air support is mostly focused on frontline troops and supporting combat operations, whereas interdiction is mainly against um, logistic units and mm. units back, but actually not really strategic attack, still on a tactical level. Okay. Um, yeah. But so, what is your view on this? Because I know you are well more well read in that aspect than I am. To be honest, it's, it's actually quite interesting because I never really thought about making a differentiation be between those things or even though you know as you say there is a, a big difference in attacking the frontline troops and then attacking what's behind them the logistics and so on um because for me generally that's goes under the aspect of ground attack um so I you have the pilot view if it's on the ground and i shoot at it it's ground attack i just want to kill it well that is but not the tactical aspect that, that is essentially what you have, for example, in the Battle of France, when the Germans enjoyed the air superiority with their Stukas. Um, during the Battle of France, a lot of these Stuka flights were unescorted and they just took off in the morning, let's say, and they flew to the front lines and they're just waiting there until they see something. And sometimes, yes, absolutely, they have a specific target, destroy that bridge, um, disrupt this uh, train that we know that is going to be heading from A to B. Uh, destroy uh, gun installations over there, destroy this kind of assembly area, and so on. Um, but that's something, for example, that you don't see a lot with the Russians, at least to my knowledge. With the Russians, it was always very clear-cut. You fly, um, you have your specific targets uh, or target area, and within that target area, you look for 
enemy troops. If they were already reported and you know that you, what you're gonna be facing, your aircrafts will be armed within the parameters that that uh, that would at least theoretically um, allow you to best engage these aircraft, uh, these these targets. Although usually it's always the same kind of armor, it's, it's rocket bombs or PTAPs or you know, of course your your cannons as well. Um, but as far as I know, the Russians did not do a lot of let's fly over the front lines and into enemy territory and specifically attack targets that are way behind, uh, which is something that I know uh, the Germans did sometimes. Yeah, that's, that makes sense because um, Germany had a strong reliance on Auftragstaktik, mission tactic, which was basically um, you could achieve your mission in which way you would see fit. Whereas I think the Russians mainly relied on very, um, which is usually called, I think, command tactic. Yeah. You get a specific order and you have to complete that order even if you realize during the execution that is probably the worst way to do it. And this is the difference. I mean, especially Germany could do this in the beginning of the war, but later on in the war they also changed it because the training and the, and the quality of the personnel dropped immensely. Oh, yeah. So Absolutely. that would actually make sense. One aspect that's interesting, I think close air support without close coordination with the ground forces is nearly impossible or very dangerous due to friendly fire, whereas interdiction is more better suited probably for targets of opportunity. Yeah. Well, um, the, the Russians, they certainly had the capability of doing interdiction, maybe not with their uh, IL-2s. But if you look at, for example, aircrafts like the Peshka or some of their their uh, medium bombers, uh, they certainly had that capability. I mean, the Peshka is an absolutely amazing aircraft in, in that regard and was often, of course, used against Baltic shipment and so on, uh, shipping. Um, but it, 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 of course, like you said, it depends really on what does the army want to achieve and in what manner and what does the army prioritize um, at, at that point. And, and oftentimes in the Russian case, uh, at least that's, what I take away from everything is, um, you know, clear cut hitting the stuff that is on the front line uh, and letting the logistics of the Germans work against themselves anyway, because we know that German logistics in the East questionable at best. Yeah, it was a little bit over optimistic. To yes, say it, at least over optimistic. Well, this was basically the end of our little chat. After all, even today, for Germans and Austrians, the topic of logistics is quite a taboo. Now, since this format is pretty new to us, we would like to have some feedback. Hence, please let us know, first, what we should start doing, second, what we should stop doing, third, what we should keep doing, and fourth, any other feedback that comes to your mind. This will help us a lot, and... Thank you for watching, please like, comment, share and subscribe and see you next time.